Hello everybody, welcome to the Seclair Chatterbox, the show where we talk about what's on our minds and the topics of the day and our experiences. I'm Mike Sorg, Director of Web Media here at Seclair, and today we're talking about uh, families and, and addiction problems within families. Uh, so we have a, uh, an expert and some, some, some students and everything around the table, so let's just go around and introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Christina Weimer. I'm a therapist here at Seclair. I've been working with families and addictions for about 17 years. My area of expertise is opioid dependence. Um, and I brought, I've been at Seclair for about, well, going up on four years. I feel what we do here is extremely beneficial, but in a different, in a different, uh, in a different way this time. It's not, old school therapy. We really use a lot of different techniques of very, very sick that I've seen quite a bit of success, which is challenging when it comes to opioid dependence. So I'm happy with what I see and I'm excited to share it with all of you. Excellent. Excellent. And go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Atar Rathbor. I'm a third year medical student currently on a psychiatry rotation here at Seclair. My name is Ishtiak. I'm a PA student from Chatham University, and I'm a second-year clinical student doing my rotations here at Seclair. Uh, I'm Omar Chaudhary. I'm a student at Seton Hill University, and I am studying what Seclair has to offer. Excellent. So, um, I guess first, uh, kind of explain, uh, you know, what what are what are the kind of problems you see out there these days? Unfortunately, what I've been seeing. Uh, well, it's been a while, and you might, may have heard the term that this opioid dependence or heroin addiction has become an epidemic um, in Westmoreland County, Allegheny County, Washington, Washington County. Um, we hear so often that children, younger, the teenagers, younger, younger children are experimenting with it because they have no fear of it. Um, they start off using pills that they have been given to them at school, Vicodin, Percocets, um, Oxycontin, Roxycontin, and they're told if they are snorting them or just ingesting them, eating them, that they won't be addicted to them. Um, very false information. Eventually, you become, you become dependent on it. And what I mean by dependent is your body becomes dependent. You begin to experience withdrawal symptoms if you do not take the medication. Um, when that happens, the withdrawal symptoms that you do experience are, um, pretty severe flu-like symptoms. You will feel nauseated, um, diarrhea, anxiety, cold sweats, hot sweats, and ability to sleep. And when that happens, people are forced to, to go and use, use um, to seek substances such as opiates. Um, and pills are very expensive, so that lasts for a, a short while. And when that happens, they begin to use heroin. Heroin, a pill usually costs about thirty dollars for maybe a forty milligram oxycontin but when you're looking at what they call stamp bags it's about seven dollars so the cost of that is uh, significant so eventually you do begin using heroin and then when you build a tolerance for snorting heroin you begin injecting it so that's what I've been seeing um, I've I've worked in a methadone clinic I ran a, a methadone clinic for a while um, was success there but nothing like we see here what we offer here is Suboxone um, Suboxone maintenance, and I do see great success. In addition to the to the maintenance, we we um we focus on the therapy. We focus on building skills um, to help the patient learn to live a better life, uh, increase the quality of their life, and it really seems to be working. Um, I also do. We also deal with mental health, and in my opinion, they they pretty much go hand in hand. Um, so we deal with both. So with that said, um, heroin addiction has become an epidemic. It's, it's, it's tough on the whole family. And I do see a lot of that. I, see, you know, it's tough on the, on the person experiencing the, the addiction. Um, it's tough on the parents. It's tough on the siblings. It's challenging for everybody. So it's, it's a tough, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult journey, but it's a journey worth taking for recovery. And once committed, I think the whole family gains strength from the experience if done right. And, um, really have a great relationship. We're hoping that's our goal to it, enhance the relationship. Is it often difficult to get an entire family involved with a situation like this, or? It... Well, you know what? I guess not in this area. Uh, mm -hmm. In this area, we're seeing a lot of younger children, kids. I say children, younger kids. Um, when they're not ready to commit, they don't. I guess they're a little nervous telling their parents, so they don't want anybody to know. 
Mm-hmm. So I guess that would be the challenge. But we recommend that the whole family be involved. And when that happens, when everybody comes to the table and are working together, um, it seems to, it seems to flow nicely. But if they're not ready for commitment, they, they, they try not to, they try to avoid. You know, I don't want my family knowing or I don't want them involved or um, they don't understand. And the truth of the matter is they're just not ready for sobriety at this point. Because nine chances out of ten in this area, they really, the parents want to help. Everybody wants to help. In this area, for those that may be outside listening, uh, is the Westmoreland County area right. here in western P- Pennsylvania. Right. So, yeah. Is it, it's mostly just Westmoreland County. Do you get anything outside, like maybe from Pittsburgh or anything? Uh, no, we don't. Not yeah. not too much from Pittsburgh. Pretty local. Yeah, pretty local. Pretty local. Good. Washington, Indiana, Allegheny. Mm-hmm. Little. And this is more of, for those, you know, again, on the area, this is more of a rural you could say yes, absolutely. Maybe some suburban. Yes. So we're on the yes. outskirts, uh, yes. uh, east of Pittsburgh. East of Pittsburgh, right? So, um, and, and you mentioned the Suboxone treatment. I know that I've heard a lot of discussion about that versus other other treatments. Right. Uh, w- w- what's the difference? Well, uh, methadone maintenance, in my opinion, uh, I feel that it the purpose of methadone was to do for crime reduction. Mm-hmm. It was really for inner cities to reduce crime was the reason why methadone was brought in. And this so, was, this was, uh, and for those unfamiliar, this is, uh, they're pretty much replacing instead of you going and using what you're using, you go to these clinics yeah. and use this as a replacement. Well, we often say replacement, but it really, it's under a controlled environment. And that's really the key point. Mm-hmm. When it's controlled, you're, you're it's being seen by a doctor daily. It's being, and you know, it's being given to you by a nurse. Um, on a daily basis, it's uh, controlled through the DEA. So it is, it's, it's in a controlled environment. So it's a much safer, uh, way. But yes, uh, it's not a blocker. The medication is not a blocker. So you, it does create a sense of euphoria. Mm-hmm. Um, I look at methadone as something that people, you know, in a really severe case where somebody's been using for quite some time. And, and the chances, the likelihood of them be staying clean without seeking that high is very unlikely. Therefore, methadone seems to be a good route for them because they're in a controlled environment. They're, like I said, the crime reduction is low. Health hazards are also decreased. Um, they're able to have some sense of structure in their life, you know, and be an actual participant in society, which is, is definitely better than living on the streets or, you know, s- robbing banks or breaking in or stealing. Um, so that's I, I I think that methadone maintenance is definitely a good um, resource, but not necessarily for everybody. Again, in this area, we don't see a lot of younger kids using for years and years and years and have such a um, you know they're they're addicted to that level of severity. In that case, and methadone maintenance facilities are popping up everywhere, but in that case where they're not. Maybe they're not that severe. Suboxone maintenance is pretty good. <clears throat> Suboxone is a blocker. The medication is a blocker. And what that means is um, if you take something else, if you take another opiate, you will not feel anything. As And methadone is not. So you can take methadone that day and still get high, but you have to use a, a much lo- larger qu- uh, quantity than you normally would, which is at risk for overdose. With Suboxone, it, do- it doesn't work like that. It's a block- blocker. It's tapped out at 24 milligrams, so it's not that you build a tolerance for it. It You will, at 24 milligrams of Suboxone, your receptors are completely filled and blocked. Therefore, you're not getting high using any other substance, um, which is a good thing. It's very safe. It's a, it's a very safe drug if used as prescribed. Um, and it's, for, you know, it's for those patients who have not been abusing for years and years and years. And there's, cause some do seek that high. And let's face it, that's why people use to get high. So if they're unable to live a life without feeling that sense of euphoria, this isn't the route for them. But like I said, in this area, it usually is between 18 to 30 year olds. And it usually is just abusing those pills. And, you know, it's, that's the, and really need to work on themselves. And that's what we do here, working on those skills, learning about themselves, learning how to present themselves in such difficult situations. How do I handle my emotions? What do I do with this? And that is what we focus on here. So um, it seems to be very successful. And our goal is always, the minute you walk in this, in this door is to 
start getting you back out the door. Mm -hmm. And our, our goal was never to keep you on the medication for very long. Our goal was really to teach you the skills to live a productive life without medication and Suboxone included. Excellent. Excellent. You mentioned some of these uh, other, um, you know, the focus on mental health as well mm -hmm. and other, other methods. Um, uh, how, do, how, do, how are those being applied? How do we, how do we apply the skills? How do we do? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, that's a good question, actually. I have been doing this, like I said, for a long time. And, you know, it's easy to sit there and tell somebody you need to make changes and, and do things, uh, don't use or change people, places and things and take it one day at a time. And I understand all that. And it does apply. I, I, I still teach those philosophies. However, what we do here and why I'm so passionate about it is because we focus on um, simple skills to change your life. It's simple that, uh, that everybody benefits from uh, if you're using heroin or if you're depressed or if you're, you know, schizophrenic or abusing THC. We focus on real, uh, four basic areas and we're, we teach people how to, what are, our, what, what are, why do we feel emotions? And then what do I do with them when I feel them? That's called emotion regulation. We teach people how to be mindful. We teach people how to be aware of the moment and in the moment and to slow down, you know, just, just focusing on what's happening right now. And that's called mindfulness skill. We teach people interpersonal effectiveness. How do I deal with people in my life and deal with them effectively? We often, we, we have, there's so many different people in this world, you know, and it's how we, it's how we interact with them that makes us feel good about it, good or bad about ourselves. So dealing with relationships in our life, that's number three. And the fourth one is distress tolerance. And that's how to deal with stressful situations without being vulnerable to a relapse. So those, I feel really passionate about that because even though I'm not in addiction, I'm not in recovery, those basic skills have changed my life. So with that said, being in a, a therapist for how many years, I've never been passionate about anything. So when I talk about it, when I teach it, I feel really good about it and people see that. I really want, I really want what's best for them. And, and that's everybody. I mean, what we, all of the staff members here, all of us, doc, you know, the PAs, everybody that is here, I feel like they are, we're not just teaching it, we're living it. And that makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. yeah, you don't see that a lot of places. No, you don't. Well, with an agency, I mean, uh, we're not an agency, let's face it. With an agency, you you get into that, um, is it going to be better for the patient to be at an agency or worse? Because you're running into people who are still using, who aren't committed to treatment. So they're meeting people they don't want to meet. You know, they're sitting in for five hours in an, in an outpatient setting and people are exchanging numbers and talking about their good times and talking about, you know, what it just, they don't see much success. And to be honest with you, it's a 2%, 2%, 2 percent, 2 percent, 2 percent chance of being successful from opioid dependence in that setting. Um, so like I said, parents, they're scared. There's, you know, they don't, have, there's not a very good outcome. So they're scared to send them to, you know, outpatient. Inpatient is a little bit different. You're there for 28 days, but once you return home, chances, you know, you're back into that same environment and they suggest you go to outpatient where you're meeting people and being exposed to unhealthy, um, an unhealthy environment. That is not, that's not how we do things here. It's even our group settings are different than an agency setting. Um, we just, you don't know if you're there for addiction. You don't know if you're there for mental health. I mean, or nutrition. We are, that's not, we teach you the skills in group. It's like a lecture. It's, you know, it's a, um, it's like a lecture. It's a setting like a classroom. The doctor, which is unheard of, teaches you skills that we focus on, same as in therapy. And then you apply that skill out, outside of the group. And, then you come back and you discuss it. So it's not about, hi, my name is so-and-so and I'm addicted to this or this is what I'm struggling with. We're all individuals struggling with something. You, me, you, everybody. You're a, pers you know? you're a person and not a, a, an addict of this or a you know person with a problem with this. You're, Your diagnosis exactly. is not does, does not by any means define who you are. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about it because... There's so many stereotypes with addiction. You know, they're manipulators, they're thieves, all around just a bad person, they're weak, very weak-minded. Um, that isn't the case. That really is. I, I have yet to meet somebody that was a bad person. I hate using that word bad, but that's not the case, you know, yeah. and we treat everybody as an individual, yeah. and that, again, makes us unique. And as far as hooking up, you know, finding a name or talking about your drug use or anything like that doesn't happen. And believe it or not, that's a trigger. As, as much as we hate talking about a rock, you know, we hear rock bottom all the time, but 
people talk about it, it's it it triggers other people to want to use. So that's just, we just we're just we just don't do therapy that way. And I'm not right or wrong. I'm just saying in my experience, I feel that this we have, there's so much more success. I mean, it's it's hopeful because opioid dependence is not hopeful. Mm-hmm. It isn't a scary place. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um, you guys, any question? Yeah, before you know, we you talked about treatment and in a, in a very at length. What I want to know is, you know, for the parents or the teachers, how can they pick it up? The earliest signs by which they can be alerted that right. somebody is using drugs, so that they can do something effective at that right. time. Right. Uh, that is a very good question, and you hear that all the time. You know, and my husband, he's a principal, so he'll he'll come home and ask me that, that saying, you know, I just don't, I don't see it. And to be honest with you, with opiates. You're, you don't see it. You're grocery shopping with someone who's using heroin five minutes before they walked into Walmart. I mean, you just don't, you don't see it unless it's because when you're using it that long, you're using it just to feel normal. But there are things to pay attention to. You're going to look for the pinpoint eyes, which is your pupils being very small. Um, they call it nodding off. And it's not even, it's not, not nodding off when you're getting high on heroin, you're nodding off to the point where you look like you're falling asleep in your Cheerios. I'll get parents call me and say, you know, we're having dinner and my daughter's falling asleep in her, in her dinner plate that they're obviously using to get high, but just using to feel normal. What you can catch is when you're having a conversation with somebody and they're able to engage in conversation, but yet when you start talking, when as long as they're talking, they're fine. But as soon as you start, as soon as somebody else starts talking, they immediately lose focus. They're very, they're unable to keep focus. So you'll see them dozing or just wandering. You'll see one eye wandering. There, it's really difficult when you're under the influence of opiates to stay focused. Unless you are doing something productive, you're up moving around, or you're actually doing the one talking, it's hard for someone to stay focused. So in the classroom setting, you're going to see that. You're going to see the inability to stay focused. You're going to see the pinpoint eyes. Distra- they're going to be distracted easily, um, irritated, irritated very easily, you know, um, almost a different personality. You're going to see a different personality. I know in teenagers that's hard, but you're going to see a, um, almost a complete different personality. I have people in treatment I feel like I know like a brother or like a sister. And as soon as they start using, I, I, I don't even know that person. You know, they're just two different people. So you're going to see them very irritable. You're going to see them inability to focus is huge, pinpoint eyes, and just, you know, that distraction, you know, just feeling like it's all about cell phone, all about that, you know, very much into them self-absorbed. So I guess the key for the parents is to be involved and, you know, I mean, be involved like so many things we say parents should be involved. Yeah. So that they Well, you need, yeah, you have to, happening. you're going to know your kids. You're, exactly. you're going to be aware. Um we, you know, it's so tough to be a parent. I, it's my, my worst fear. It's so tough as a parent because we want so badly to believe our kids. We want so badly for not, even though it'd be right in front of you, you know, it's, it could be obvious to everybody else, but so badly in your heart, you don't want it to be true. So we tend to, we, we believe what they're telling us. And what they're telling us is probably lies, you know, in order not to get caught. Um, but just try not, try not to be, just be open-minded, you know. We're, as a parent, we're there to help them grow independently. We're not there to enable, and I know that's a buzzword, enable, that's a tough, there's a fine line there, but um, just stay open. Stay open to the possibility. You know, it doesn't make you a bad, doesn't make you a bad parent or a bad child, or it just, it is what it is. And if they, even if they were just experimenting with things and got caught up in it, now addicted, it is what it is. And with, if you being naive to it doesn't help you and it doesn't help the child. But as far as the parents are concerned, always be aware, always be involved, know your child, look for the signs, you know, they're there. It's just whether or not the, the parent wants to believe it. And, you know, my, I often have kids say, my, my parent has no idea. They have, they're so naive, they have no idea. And then when I talk to the parents, they've known for a year. You know, they just, they didn't want to know. They really didn't want to know. But there's nothing, there's really no one thing that's making a child use. It's just, it's, it's the in thing to do right now. You know, drug dealers now are the popular guys. If you got the drugs and you're considered the drug dealer in high school now, 
that's bigger than playing a football, being on a football team, or you got all the girls if you're a drug dealer. I mean, they, you are the popular kid. So it's, um, people think it's the thing to do, but they have no idea what they're messing with. Is this a media issue that the way they're portrayed on television? You know what? I see it on TV, but, uh, you know, I'll see some things on TV because I am aware of it, but I don't, I don't think so. I just think that it got started. Um, it just it it just got started and people started liking the way it made them feel. This is and happening in the social like this the, the society of of schools. Absolutely, basically. you're completely independent. Absolutely, absolutely, it is. Um, kids getting Vicodin from their parents, mm -hmm. uh, getting it in the medic their grandparents. Um, sh you know, then they're cool because oh, Joe has so and so, and now they're cool. Run to him and get it. And at first, it's all, at first, in any addiction, it's always controlled and fun and everybody loves it. That's, and we, you know, that's the toughest part about addiction because we're always trying to get back to that point where I can control it and still have fun with it. But once you're an addict, there's never that point again. That's why they say you are powerless over the drug. Um, so it's fun. It's, kids are having fun. There's, there's not much to do around here. You know, they're playing, they're into video games. It's always funner to play video games when you're high. I mean, it's just, that's just what has happened to be the thing to do lately, you know, this day and age, apparently. So when you're the drug dealer, you're the cool kid now. You know, that's, girls rush to, that, that's just what they do. So one thing leads to the next and, you know, you graduate and you think, oh, this is temporary and it leads into your later life. And before you know it, you're 30 years old and you're shooting heroin and never thought it would end up like this. But it's a it's a terrible, terrible, terrible disease. And opiates and kids don't realize it. I mean, it is it, t it changes the chemistry in your brain. It takes over your whole mind process, your th whole thought process. And they have no idea. Mm -hmm. It's fun. And to tell them that, even if you were to educate they still feel like they have control. They still feel yeah, like I mean, it's we, not going to happen to me. I mean, we had the, the, the big anti-drug, war on drugs mm -hmm. campaign, mm -hmm. which you know, has been, you know, the panel you ask, you know, has not been a success at, at all. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's been, it, it's not changing these perceptions. Well, the thing, the problem with that was we, we really used the fear tactic mm -hmm. with that and, and, it did work with some. People were very fearful. If they used cocaine the first time, they'd die or their heart would explode. Or And heroin, nobody really even heard of that. But, I mean, it did work on a few. But then I think once it started coming around where this isn't going to kill me, it actually feels great. I'm having a blast. You know, I can, you know, often teenagers tell me that heroin made me feel like I had a mask on, that I could finally be somebody, I could finally fit in. I could mm -hmm. finally feel some way that, you know, that I wanted to, you know, I could finally be that person I've always wanted to be. And when you hear that from your friends in school, that's more powerful than the teacher saying, saying no. Oh, and, of course. Scary thing. So if a friend comes up to you, a peer comes up to you and says, listen, they're full of it. You know, they're, it's not going to kill you. It feels great. It's, you're not, you know, it's not like, it's not heroin. It's just a Vicodin. It's just like doing... You know, they're going to they're gonna experiment with it. And the fear tactic went right out the window. And I mm -hmm. think that's kind of where it exploded. Mm -hmm. But And then, I mean, at first I think it is they start off just ex wanting to know how it feels. And then recognizing all of the other things, that it, like the mental health piece to it. Let's face it, we all have low self-esteem when we're teenagers. <laughs> you know what I mean? Everybody, we all think that everybody has a better life than we do and better parents than we do and a nicer home than we do and... We all do that. We all, so we're uh, all teenagers looking back. We can all say we all felt that way, but we, at the time, we felt like we're the only ones. So having something that makes all that go away and makes you popular because <laughs> you got a supplier or a hookup. Yeah. They're going to keep doing it and they don't realize what it leads into. It's a scary place. And, and, you know, we can do prevention and I have done that route too, but. Teenagers, we can talk, 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 and 15 down years down the road, they can finally say, oh, yeah, now I, you know, but it, they they just feel like they know everything. I've been there, done that. We all have. You know, we know what's best for well, us. I kind of wonder, even within our own social circles, how many parents, you know, truthfully have this conversation with their kids, like mothers talking to their daughters about pregnancy. I mean, I don't know. How many parents, you know what, parents... You, from my experience, have no idea how severe this is. From my experience, they they think you know, all I did was drink, and that wasn't that. There is an addiction in our family, and they just don't have a clue. So my thoughts are, and they have, um, they do this great program up at the courthouse in Greensburg. 
um, to educate parents. I think parents need to be educated is where mm-hmm. we need to begin. Parents need to be educated on what they're looking for. Um, how severe this actually is, you know, what kids are actually doing. That way they, they know what they're, you know, they know what they're getting into because they're, they're blinded to the whole thing. They have no idea. I mean, do, do you, I didn't. I mean, do you know about heroin? Uh, you think mm-hmm. heroin's inner city, people living on the street? It's not the case. That is not the case. That's what my, you know, question was. I mean, I haven't had this conversation with my kids, but I would want to. Yeah. So that I am one step ahead where they seek it, who gets it, what is the yeah. modus operandi. If I don't know that, I, I wouldn't have a clue. He might yeah. be at school. He might be somewhere else. He might be at a different home. We don't know. Well, I know when I was in school, you it was it wasn't it wasn't cool even to smoke marijuana. It wasn't it wasn't a cool thing to do, but it's quite the opposite now. But as a parent, I, I mean, you tell me why is it that you you don't have this conversation if you know working in this field, you know that it's a problem. What's stopping you from having a conversation? I think I would go back to the statement you made is about, you know, trusting your children too much. You just feel like it just wouldn't happen to them. We, I know we always think that you know, not me. Right. It is always the other kid. Right. But I think you made a valid point there by, you know, maybe I'll go home today and talk to my kids about, you know, drugs. Yeah. They may not like it, but the thing is we should initiate and, you yeah. know, drive home a point maybe once every X number of times yeah. till, you know, we can at least achieve something right. instead of not trying and thinking, you know, the school is going to do something right. about it. Right. And I that's did. a good point. We think that the schools are doing something when they're educating our kids about it. But to the kids, it's a joke. I mean, I don't see much even in the media about drugs. I don't. I mean, drinking. I drinking, I'm, I agree. Drinking is something that the media definitely puts out there that everybody should be drinking and having even car commercials. The only thing missing in this car is martini hour or whatever. Mm-hmm. You that? I, mean, I, g- I get confused is. whether they're trying to sell the woman or the car or the pillow or the juice. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> No, I agree with you. But as far as like the um, pills and things like that, I don't, I've seen it, but it's not too bad. Um, but as far as a parent is concerned, I suggest you educate yourself prior to that conversation. Okay. Uh, you need to go into it looking, you need to be prepared. You need to know what you're talking about because you don't want to be someone, just another adult, you know, blowing. Can I say it? Blowing smoke up my ass. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And that's what they're going to look at you as, you know, just another adult who doesn't know what they're talking about. You want them to know that you're serious. You want them to know that you know what you're talking about. You want them to trust that if I use this drug, I can become dependent on it. I can be addicted to it. It could change the course of my life. This is serious. You need to, and, and you, it, it, you can't do that if you're kind of knowing, kind of not knowing, you know, because that's what the teachers are just reading right out of the book or the curriculum that they are advised to give through the health department or whatever. And that does, that pays no relevance to them. It, it is tough, but I think, you know, you have to get involved. Yes, you, you can't do. just let it go, trusting them or whatever the reason may be. You have to be one step ahead in whatever they do. They may not like it, but you have to make efforts. I think the other problem is, a lot of disconnect between the parents and the children where Mm -hmm. they try to today's kids they're more smart they're more materialistic so they get satisfied by taking their parents down a guilt trip Mm -hmm. so you know they just have to say some gadget or something and the parents are too busy working so they give it to them Mm -hmm. child is happy till the next holiday right where he again takes the parent on a guilt trip so the sometimes the parents have really no idea what's happening about anything you're right you're right And that is one of the great things that we, you know, we always want to, and myself included, I have three children. We always want to give more to our children. You know, we want to give them more than what we had. You know, we will be better parents if we're able to provide more for our children. So we work harder and they get more. We become more disconnected. And I think we need to get back to the basics. And, and, and part of what we do, including the family here at Seclair, what we, you know, when we do family therapy, we're teaching you how to get back to the basics in a, as a parent, teaching you how to be mindful. And mindfulness is being aware of the moment, you know, being not 
not do, 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 you know, and, and life passes you by. That's the dis, you know, we're disconnected with life in general, not just to our children. So teaching those basic skills again, it's not about the material things. It's about the bond you create with each other. It's about what you do while you're here on this earth and while you're present and the relationship you have developed with your child. And that's why I said it's so significant as a parent to talk to your child about these things when you're educated and when you're prepared for it, because believe it or not, they're, they look up to you. They may not show you, but they do. They really, really do. They look up to you. They want to, they, they want to believe in you. They want to know that you know the answers. They want to know these things. They feel safe. Kids feel safe when they're in a controlled environment. Gadgets, technology is not a controlled environment. The only thing it's doing is giving them instant gratification. And let me tell you what, heroin is instant gratification. Unlike drinking, unlike marijuana, I mean, instant gratification. In addition to technology, this is the one thing that provides that instant gratification, and we need to keep that in mind. You know, it's, it's, techno, it's technology is a great thing. Don't get me wrong, but mm -hmm. it, it certainly we've we've got to adjust ourselves to it. Let me just say that. I may mean, I mean, be off the road here, but is there anything in the pipeline from Seclare where they're going to kind of, you know, talk with the schools or something for a part of the social education? We actually, the schools through St. Vincent College does a, uh, SAP program, student assistance program, and they educate, they, they bring in people in recovery and educate the local school districts, which I think is very empowering. I think that it really, it really sends a strong message when somebody, they see some, uh, you know, a beautiful young lady standing there that used to be a heroin addict, you know, and what she, her experiences in life and how she overcame it. I think that is more, um, but what we are going to do here at Seclair is offer family uh, through dr through groups. I think it's going to be in the beginning of March. I'll he'll update that. But in March, we're going to offer recovery group in, to include the families in what they have to do because they need to be involved. They need to be involved. We need to start. We need to start making some changes, you know, or maybe not. You know, getting back to our basics of what what life is about, what makes us happy. I mean, I think your approach is a just and balanced one in terms of involving the family at the same time because it also gives a positive feedback to the kid mm -hmm. that their family is going to support them Absolutely. and they haven't given up on them. Absolutely. Which I truly believe in. I, and I think it's a good idea. I don't see it often that, you know, you have those kinds of sessions right. with those kinds of populations. Right, right. Yeah, we are... Uh, Dr. Chaudhary always says, you know, the first question he'll ask is the family involved in this, is the family, Be because it is. And as a parent, I have young ones, but I cannot imagine how scary that must be. That must be so scary to know that my child is injecting heroin. I mean, I just, that must be such a scary thing. Uh, however, once we get past that initial shock, and able to make changes, it is, it, it's a journey. It's a challenging journey. I will give you that. But I see a lot of strength and wisdom being developed through recovery. It's such a, it's, it's a positive experience if you allow it to be. If you're at the right place and you're in the right state of mind, it's it's a, it's a positive experience. You know, we look at it as the end of the world or this is the worst thing that's ever happened. It's not. It may feel like it at first, and as a parent, I couldn't imagine. But it's not. And even as a child, even as a teenager, or as an adult, admitting to yourself that you need this drug to function every day. Could you mm -hmm. imagine waking up? And the first thing that comes to your mind or the last thing you think about before you go to bed is how am I going to get something or where am I going to get something in order to function the next day? Or I'm going to be sick as a dog. I just can't imagine that. That must be really tough. Well, obviously, they just think they steal money, they do other kinds of stuff. Oh, they're desperate. put themselves at risky behavior. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I don't encourage watching the news, but it's usually, you know, bank robberies or broke you know stealing you know house getting broken into or um a lady's purse being stolen at giant eagle parking lot or um it's happening closer and closer as you look around you know it's happening in your plaza at giant eagle and it's happening in your complex in your development and it's happening and they're good kids they're kids from good families you know uh just it 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 it's difficult. It's really difficult, but it's it's a journey worth taking, and it's a journey for everybody. It's your own journey and in, in your own in your own way, and it's what you do with it. So, like I said, I think that it's it's a 
It can be a, it can be a positive experience if everybody's ready for it. But I think as a parent and as teachers even, I think the teacher, knowing my husband's in the field, they need to educate themselves on what to look for. They don't know. Another big uh, uh, substance abuse is benzodiazepines. They're combining, which is Xanax, Clonopin, Valium, Ativan. They're combining heroin or opiates, Percocet or Vicodin, with a Xanax. And I, I had a um, coroner that worked on our board when I worked at a methadone clinic. He said, I bet you 95% of all overdoses is because of the two, the combination of the two. They both suppress your heart rate. Kids go to sleep, which suppresses your heart rate to another level, and they don't wake up. That's, and that's majority of, and they have no idea. They're completely in a, in a coma. And that's how, that's how we're seeing a lot of overdoses recently. I mean, they're, they're really naive to this drug world, mm -hmm. and that's scary, you know? But teachers need to, they, like I said to my, said that to my husband, he says, I never even heard of a Xanax. And they, I mean, Xanax are just, they're going crazy in the schools right now. Xanax and stuff. I'm thinking, how do you not know what that is? But teachers need to be educated. Parents need to be educated. It trickles, it's a trickle down effect, you know? We're getting there though. On that note, if anybody wants uh, to ask any more questions of you, is there a way they can contact you? Uh, absolutely. On the web, on the website at seclair dot com, mm -hmm. or just simply calling. The information is on the website. Calling in the office and and asking if you just even if you have questions, maybe you're having doubts yourself. Maybe you're you know using substances yourself. If you just have any questions that we can at any way guide you in the right direction, mm -hmm. refer you in the right direction, we would be glad to do so. Are there any other uh, general resources for those that maybe not? in the uh, Westmoreland County area, uh, wherever they may be? My suggestion to you is contact your local police department mm -hmm. because they are responsible for providing the information to the public. So that's they, they're the ones who set up uh, programming the prevention project through St. Vincent and through the courthouse, and they are excellent. They really are. So contact the local state police department and ask them for educational um activities or events that are going on involving substance abuse um and i think that one at the at the courthouse is maybe even weekly mm -hmm. it's a really good for parents educational tool for parents Excellent. Excellent. so and here i mean even if you call in in the office you can email my email address is on the website to claire's website if you have a question and you want to remain anonymous and you don't want to talk to receptionists, I understand that. I have plenty of people who email me. So you can shoot me an email, and I will gladly assist you in any way I can. You've been taking on a lot of the technology lately, actually. I've been taking on? <laughs> you've been taking on a lot of technology. Well, Skype, you've been, you've been using a bit yeah, as well. Yeah, I like so. doing Skype. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> we'll have a conversation about that as well here in the future show. Yeah. So, um, well, on that note, thank you very much. No it's been problem. very informative. No it problem. was a great talk. And uh, awesome. thank you for the questions. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and, and if, uh, uh, and thank you for joining us on the Chatterbox. Uh, please go to seclair.com, like we mentioned, for past episodes and find out when we record live so you can, uh, uh, you know, watch us do this thing, uh, live. Ask any questions, uh, there in the chat room. And if you do have any comments or ideas for future episodes, please email me at mike at seclair.com and you're welcome to continue the conversation on our blog in the comments for this episode over at seclair.com slash blog. And next time we'll see you in the chatterbox.